It is my uh, honor today to um, give the message, and we will be in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. Uh, I know that's not what it says on the bulletin. Uh, that's because Pastor Gabe was planning on preaching this morning, but as we've said, he wasn't feeling well, um, and we pray the Lord will uh, heal him quickly. Um, this is a sermon that I have preached before. Uh, last year, uh, in August, I finished my master's degree, uh, and this was the final sermon that I preached. I chose it this morning um, because I've been wanting to preach it for a long time, to be honest, and it ties, I hope you'll see the connection to the Christmas season in the resurrection of Christ. It when we celebrate the, the child's birth, when we celebrate Christ's coming, it's not just that night that we're celebrating. We, se we have this day we call Christmas. We celebrate the, the birth of Christ. We celebrate all the good things that Christ brought. When the angels declared peace on earth, goodwill to men, it wasn't only because the baby was born, but the man he would become and the death he would lead and live, the death he would um, receive and the resurrection. And if there's a single point in the good news in the gospel that we can point to and say, that's the good news, it would be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because it's the culmination of all of his work, his birth, his sinless life, his suffering and pain for sins, all culminates in this moment where he comes back to life, the testimony that God is uh, going to res resurrect his people. The message today in 1 Corinthians the, the main point is it, that in Christ, there is a lasting hope. You see, Paul is combating hopelessness in the church of Corinth as he writes this letter. People have been telling them, there's no resurrection. You, people don't come back from the dead. You've missed the resurrection. These are things that, that Christians faced in the, in the first century and we face today. When you tell someone that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ that you're going to come back from the dead, you'll get smirks and laughter, and how could you believe such a nonsense thing? Paul's main point is in this text is that in Christ there's a lasting hope because he did come back from the dead. The famous or infamous, depending on who you ask, John Calvin points out that in Adam we die and we recover life only in Christ. That word only is very important. It is only in Christ that the resurrection is seen. You may have seen the bumper stickers or the statements on Facebook that say, Buddha's dead. Muhammad is dead. Christ lives. Christ is the only one that lives. Christ is the only way to God. Indeed, Calvin hit the heart at the heart of the matter because it's a matter of life and death when we speak of Christ and his gospel. What we should consider today is the word hope. As you guys have seen, uh, the, the, the ones have heard the last few Wednesday's sermons as we've gone through Isaiah 9, the whole first part of that verse, all, that chapter, all the way through verse 7, is about hope. It talks about those who are in anguish, no longer being in anguish, the land that was in darkness, seeing a great light. Those that were in the shadow of death themselves have seen light. And it's this this proclamation of hope in the Word of God. And that proclamation of hope isn't limited to Isaiah. We'll find it right here in Corinthians, the word hope. And then you have to ask yourself the question, what do we hope in? And is that foundation of our hope able to bear the weight of the need? Think about that for a moment. There are all kinds of hope in this world. If I buy the lottery ticket scratcher, I might have a million dollars and my financial troubles will be over. If I take this pill, I'll feel better. If I see this doctor, or I try this method, or I do this, or I do that, there's all kinds of calls to hope in this world. But in the end, we find they cannot bear the scrutiny. How many people will win that lottery number out of how many people will win the, or will buy those lottery scratchers? It, it's, an, it's a fleeting hope. It has nothing that lasts. The foundation of our hope that is able to bear it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the text, Paul is addressing three main points here tonight. The centrality of Christ's resurrection, the proclamation of the gospel, the forgiveness of sins as the Christian hope. There's three main uh, 
things Paul's addressing. So what hope? What hope are we talking about? It is important that the Christian understands that the gospel is good news because it is hope. When we proclaim the gospel, which means the word means good news, we're proclaiming hope. We're proclaiming life. As we ended um, last Wednesday, I made the comment that how much is it, how much hate is it when we don't tell someone about this hope? In, in my mind, as I, as I read about Christ and about the hope in Him, hiding that hope from someone is the ultimate hate. Because the people need hope. That's why lottery tickets sell. That's why the uh, popular books on the New York Seller's Best Time lists are Be Financially Successful, B uh, Live Your Best Life Now, A Purpose Driven Life. People need this thing to grab onto, and we have the real deal. We have the real hope in Jesus Christ. We have what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, you were once dead in your, in your trespasses, but God made us alive in Christ. We have, the, we have the proclamation that we were once in the valley of the shadow of death. We were once in darkness, and this great light came upon us, and we are no longer that. We now walk in the land of the living. We now have life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Well, what happens when the ideologies of the world challenge that truth? Because they do. Every day they do. As we gather today, on Sunday, we call it the Lord's Day. The purpose is to celebrate Christ. Simply by being here as Christians, we are confessing the risen Savior. We're confessing the Lord's day that He came. We do this every week. We confess the day that the Lord came. We celebrate the risen Christ. And I hope in this text you will see the centrality of that resurrection, that resurrection day, the Lord's day, in Paul's explanation of the gospel, the good news. How central it is to your hope in Christ. Paul picks up in the text with, now if Christ, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. The Apostle Paul picks up with the text, Now if Christ, and there's not a more excellent starting place, right? The place to, to meditate. Now if Christ. Anything that follows that statement is going to be really important. It's going to be really important for your life. It's going to be really important for your Christianity. It's going to be really important for who, you're, who you are if you call yourself a Christian. If we're going to meditate on hope, that's the starting point. Now, if Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, or 15, excuse me. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 14 reads as follows. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Paul writes, how can some of you say? See, Paul is addressing, as I said, an issue. He, he steps right in to set straight something, a controversy that had, has, had arisen in the church. People were saying, there's no resurrection from the dead. Once you die, it's over. Have you heard that, that uh, ideology before in our world? You'll find it alive and well today. We call it atheism, sometimes agnostic beliefs. You got this life. You're made of stardust. You're an accident. Enjoy what you got, and then it's over. Paul set straight into that. He said, uh-uh, that's not Christian. That's, that's not a, that is not what we believe. There are some that said, we believe Jesus was on earth. These are the, the people in Corinth. They're, they're, this is what they're saying. We believe Jesus was on earth. We might even believe that he was God. But everybody knows people don't come back from the dead. This was the same conclusion that was in their world as well. They faced, the Corinthians faced the same kind of world and ideologies that we do. Remember, Paul addresses the intellectuals of the day on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. 
He stands before him and he proclaims the gospel and he gets to the end of his presentation and he says that God has appointed a day on, he will, on which he will judge the world in righteousness and a man by which he will judge the world, Christ, and he has proven this by raising him from the dead. And what did the academics of Paul's day do? In Acts 17, 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. They said, yeah, right. People don't come back from the dead. This, this is a madman. Your, 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 your philosophy was interesting up to this point. But you see, what Paul was proclaiming wasn't philosophy. It was the revelation of God. Jesus Christ did come, and he did rise from the dead. It's not a, a uh, philosophical idea or a way of explaining reality. Rather, it's a specific event. A gospel without a raised Christ, Paul says, is only vanity. He says, and if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. He said, this doesn't work. This doesn't make sense. If Christ is not raised, then it's vanity. You know, that, that word vanity, we find it in the, in the scriptures, in the book of um, Ecclesiastes, uh, where this wise man writes a book and he explores all of the things of the world, all of the places in the world, all of the things you can do, from being rich to being poor, from being drunk to being sober, from, from stoic living to, to the kind of live, to debauchery and all the kinds of living. He says it's all vanity. Vanity of vanities. Wind passing away. Nothing. That's the same word Paul uses here, the same concept Paul says. If you, if you don't believe Christ came back from the dead, then your faith is is in the wind. It's nothing. It blows away. It does, has no substance. Here's a, an illustration maybe that will help us understand why. If our faith is in Jesus Christ, if we say we are Christians, we believe in Jesus, then we are making a statement about who that Jesus is. The world is making all kinds of statements about who Jesus is. It's, it's necessary for us to evaluate these statements. For example, I've used this analogy before several times. I think I did it in the class this morning. If I have a friend named Mac, right? He's this little white guy. I actually do have a little friend, little white guy friend named Mac. He's not much taller than that. And somebody comes up to me and goes, oh yeah, I know your friend Mac. And I say, okay, describe him to me. He says, yeah, he's this six foot seven black guy. He's good at basketball. I'm like, you're not talking about my friend Mac. If we if someone comes to us and goes, well, Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead. Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God. He was a good teacher. Jesus Christ was a crazy man from the first century. Right? You're not talking about my Jesus. You're not talking about the, the, the Christ that I know, the one that I confess. When I say Jesus, I mean something very specific. I mean the, the, the Son of God who was born that night on Christmas, lived a perfectly sinless life, suffered for my sins in my place on the cross and rose from the dead, having victory over death itself. This is important. What Paul is teaching the, the Corinthians is to be on guard against false doctrine. Just as there are many worldly ideologies we've already pointed to that influence us or, or target us the same way the Corinthians were targeted, we have false gospels, false ideologies that creep into the church. False explanations of who Jesus get, is. The, one of the most, I, I think pernicious is a good word, evil false doctrines that run around the world today is the idea of the health and wealth gospel. Right? That Jesus came and died so that I could be healthy, wealthy, I could have my car, I could have my house, I could have all of these things. We've already confessed that God takes care of His people. God blesses and takes care of His people. There's no question about that. But why did Christ come and die? So that I could have peace with God. So when someone comes along and tells me, well, Christ died for this, or Christ died for that, well, who, what Christ? Is it the Christ of Scripture? Is it the Christ that I confess? Because what Paul is telling us today, and he told the Corinthians back then, if you don't confess the right Christ, if you don't have the right Christ, you don't have the gospel. You have vanity, air, nothing. It's our job to be on guard against these false gospels, and they come in all sh shapes and forms. They come from the ultra-pietist, the one who is 
all about holiness. You have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. You have to, to keep the Passover, and you can't eat pork, and you can't do all of those things. That's a false gospel. It comes from the one who turns Christ into a man-centered thing. Christ died for me. Christ died so that I could have, that I could have, rather than Christ dying for the glory of God. We have to be on guard against small, anthropocentric, man-centered gospels. We have to be looking for the Christ that is glorious, the one who's at the center of all things. Notice Paul's confession when he says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vanity. What's the center of their faith? Christ. Not what I get, not what Christ can do for me. Christ is the center of my faith. Christ is the center of where Paul is pointing the Corinthians today. R.C. Sproul is commenting on the Corinthians and the world that they face. He said they probably had fallen prey to Greco-Roman ideologies. You know, R.C. Sproul points to Greco-Roman ideologies, and the truth is we deal with many of them today. The big influencers of thought in the world are still people like Plato and Aristotle and the Greco-Roman ideologies, which have their useful places, but only under the knowledge of God, only in as much as they point us to God. They listened to the culture, they listened to the culture and placed it, input, its input above the gospel that had been preached to them. See, if we consider their worldview choice in verses 15 through 17, we'll see that they're not basing their understanding on what Paul had told them. They're not basing their understanding on the revelation of God, but rather on their own ideas. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 through 17, reads as follows. If we are found, uh, we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. Whom did He, whom, <coughs> whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. That, that's a tough sentence there. For if the dead were not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Notice there's those three points that I talked about. The three things Paul is getting at. This is the second one. Paul started off with, your faith is futile if Christ be not raised. Now he makes another application to the same thing. He says, if, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And here's my second point. You're still in your sins. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is part of the gospel. It is what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. He says, if you believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is the, the formula that Paul preached. This is what the Corinthians would have heard him preach when he was there with them. If you call Christ Lord... If you publicly live out Christ's lordship in your life and you confess in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what do you have to confess to God in your heart? What do you have to understand to confess that God raised him from the dead? Well, first of all, you have to understand that he died and that he lived and that he was born. If you confess Christ's resurrection, the culmination of the gospel, you're confessing all of it. He had to be born. He had to live a life worthy of being the sacrifice. He had to die in order to be raised from the dead. When you confess the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when Paul says in Romans that when you confess the resurrection, when you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he's saying you believe the Christ of the Bible. You believe the, the whole story, the virgin birth, the, the, the uh, life that he lived, the miracles that God did through him. You believe in this Christ. What are the consequences, according to Paul, for the, um, for the, the word I'm looking for is a misstep, misdirection of the Corinthians. Right? We're, not, we're not talking about people who are uh, uh, intentionally evil. These are people that, uh, that are Christians, right? They're in the church. They're just like us today. They're part of the body of Christ. They confess Jesus, but they've been led astray. They've stepped off the path because of something. What's the consequences that Paul is talking about? He explains some dire consequences. He says the good news within the gospel that is 
the, that the, it, the believer is freed from sin and justified, made righteous before God. But Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, if this gospel that you have, complained, uh, that you have uh, gone away from, it was shown to you and you've gone away from it, if this is not true, what's the problem? You're still dead in your sins. The sins of the world, the sins of humanity, are what keep us separated from God. It was the angels that came and proclaimed, peace on earth, goodwill to men. How is that peace accomplished? The debt, the sin between the, the human and God, the enmity between human and God, the enmity that came in the garden where Adam and Eve ran and hid themselves rather than running to God. That sin, that separation from God, is still upon you if Christ hasn't been raised. The word here, uh, futile, translated in, in the ESV, your, your faith is futile, uh, matos, means useless, empty. Right? It, your, your faith is, is vacuous. You have this, this structure, this, this, you, this beautiful house from the outside. You confess the God, Jesus Christ. But when you walk up to the door and you open it, and you walk in, it's empty. It's not a home. There's not a house here. It's a facade. Or even, or another way to explain it would be like a false front. If you ever walk through an old uh, west um, example ghost town, right, where they have all those faces of the buildings. There's no building behind it, but there's faces on the buildings. You can walk down, feel like you're walking down the old, old city of Tombstone streets. But if you were to walk over to any one of those buildings, there's nothing there. You open the door, there's not even a building. That's the kind of picture that Paul is giving of faith. The restoration of the hope found in the gospel is the freedom from sin. It's the, it's the building up of the house. As Christ says of his church, I will build my church. How does he do it? He does it, as Peter tells us, with living stones, us. He takes sand, nothing to build on, restores it, makes it whole, makes it a stone, and then he puts it into the wall and he builds his church. Each one of us stand upon this truth. And the reason our faith is not useless is because of the central hope found in the restoration. Paul, Paul is saying, look, the problem is you've got the house, but you don't have anything in it. You've got the, the front of the store, the, 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 the building, but if you open the door, there's nothing in it. If you take Christ's resurrection out of Christianity, it's another story. It's another idea. It's another way. Take Christ out of Christianity and you just have another religion that doesn't get you anywhere. A search for hope that is not true. Let me see if I can bring it home with a Christmas illustration. I remember this happening several times as a kid. I run downstairs, run into the living room. Mom and dad are already there. The Christmas tree is set up. The presents are underneath it. Right, presents I've been waiting weeks to open. Mom hands me a gift. I tear into it. And what do I get? Socks. Right, now, as an adult, that's a, I'm happy with that. Socks are great. I, I'll take socks any day. But you see that disappointment that the child experiences? What if that disappointment is concerning our life, eternal life? That's what Paul is saying here. You run downstairs. You tear open the package. And you're disappointed because there's no life in what you have in there. There's no gospel peace. This is something we cannot afford to be disappointed about. This is not something we can afford to be wrong about. If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. If Jesus said that, don't fear those who can kill the body, but, though, but the one who can cast both body and soul into hell, if Jesus said these things and they are true, this is not something we can afford to get wrong. We have to have the gospel right. The Apostle Paul makes it absolutely clear to the Corinthians that your gospel is not right unless it has the right Jesus at its center. The Jesus, the Jesus that came and was born of a virgin. The, Je the Jesus that lived a sinless life. The one who did all those miracles. The Jesus who died on the cross in such a bloody and, and horrible way, but and experienced in that moment the, the weight of the sin of all of his people and the Jesus that God proclaimed he will judge the world through in righteousness by bringing him back from the dead. See, what Paul's talking about here, what we can't afford to be disappointed about is a matter of eternal life. 
It's a matter of life and death. It is a matter of the fact that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, walking after the course of this world until Christ, until we are made alive in Christ by God. This is a... This is a necessary truth. One of the things today that happens today, and I find it in, even in some of my fellow theologians and, and students at seminary, I find it all over, doesn't matter where you're at, is the Facebook gospel. The Facebook truth. Thinking that we can sum up a truth in a few words. Thinking that we can sum up Jesus Christ and what he did in a, in a few little words. There's some value to a quick gospel message, but what Paul is talking about here is a deep understanding of who Christ is. The necessity of believing in Christ as he's preached in the word. What is it that Paul uh, brings them to? Well, life and death, Paul points today. He says, what hope do we have if Christ has not been raised? In verses 18 and 19, he gives the Corinthians a painful, practical example of the necessity of this. He gives the, the Corinthians something sobering to think about. It's easy to, perhaps, think, ah, eternity, it'll take care of itself. Issues, issues of eternity, pfft, not my problem today. I got, I got things to worry about today. Paul brings it home in verses 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 18 and 19. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If, Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, anyone in this room it's above a tender age, understands the pain of loss. Everybody in this room has, uh, that is old enough to understand, has, has lost. Understands that loss. Notice how Paul goes right to the heart here. Paul didn't pull punches and, and be nice. He went, he went straight to the heart of it. He said, you know that loved one? You know that person that, that confessed Christ and died before you, you're never going to see them again if Christ hasn't been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then they've fallen asleep. If there's no resurrection, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, he says. Notice that word. It ceased to exist, disappeared, perished, become nothing. Jesus' resurrection is the hope for things past, for the loss of loved ones, it is also dependence for the present. What does that mean? It's, it's dependable. Dependence. It's something that we can stand on. Whether it's someone that you lost recently, whether it's someone that went to, to be with Christ five generations ago, whether it's your future as you walk in this uncertain world, unknowing when you walk out that door what's going to happen, whether, you're gonna, whether you, your heart will keep beating tomorrow, whether that uh, drunk driver is going to run you off the road. You don't know the answer to these things, but if you have a Christ that is raised and you are in Him, there is dependable hope. There is always hope. If God can send His own Son thousands of years after He promised it in Genesis, coming to a specific place in time, to a specific woman in time, to a specific city in time, to live a specific kind of life in time, to die a specific kind of way and be raised on the third day. If God is in that much control of history, when you confess the resurrection of Christ, that's what you're confessing. God's ultimate control of history. God's ultimate control of what's going on. You can walk out that door going, nothing's going to happen to me that God hasn't already seen, hasn't already planned. His provision for me is already done. And if he decides to take me home today because of the drunk driver, amen. I'm going home, and I'm not going to stay dead. I'm going to live forever. This is a dependable hope. This is a real hope. This is, you've often, 
uh, you may have, if you, if you run in the circles that I have, you may have often heard Christianity compared to other religions. It's just another religion. The Bible is just another religious book. But no religion, no religion has this ground for hope. The real historical Jesus that really did come back from the dead. Nobody has that besides God's people. And what would they say? We have hope. We have hope in Christ. Our hope in Christ is, use a big word here, eschatological. It's future. It's, it is the culmination. Christ is raised, and because he is raised, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Some people would say, well, Paul was a little bit brutal there. Paul was, Paul was a little bit brutal there. Well, if you love someone when someone has died, you don't tell them, oh, they'll be back. Right? They're dead. You don't, you don't tell them, oh, Johnny, I, I know your mother's just gone for a while. She'll be back. That's not loving of that child. You address the issue. That you, it's not loving of a, of a person when you pretend away death. Paul doesn't hear. Paul cares for the Corinthians. He says, this is a life and death matter. This is a life and death matter. And I love you enough to tell you, guess what? Not in this lifetime, but in the next, your mother's going to live again. Your brother will live again. Your sister will live again. These people that knew Christ will live again. That's what we have here. How do we apply this? We have been promised in the gospel the return of our dear king and our loved ones in Christ. Remember what Paul says at the end of this. He says, If in Christ we have only hope in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why? Why would Paul say, we are of all people most to be pitied rather than those other people who don't even believe in the resurrection? Well, it's quite simple. We have life. We have real life in Christ. We can experience the real joys of God. The, the world, all of the joy of the world, all of the joy of the things that aren't in Christ is emptiness in the end, is, is death in the end. But if we have a real joy in Christ that ends, then we've lost something real. Those who have no joy, those who have no joy in Christ, they haven't lost anything when they die. But if we're not raised after we die, we've lost something real, something in Christ. The Apostle Paul goes deep and says, we're the most to be pitied. And it's true. The Apostle grounds his hope on the actual and literal and definite resurrection of Christ. Uh, a resurrection witnessed by 500 people. A, a resurrection written about and preserved in history in a way that no other book has. The, the, the testimony of God in the scriptures is, is so overwhelmingly true that you have to be dead in your sins to, to deny it. You have to be dead in your stand, sins to stand away from it. The application that we have here, the promise in the gospel, the return of our dear king, I want to, if you permit me for a moment, to talk about that concept of the dear king. When we sing the Christmas hymns, when you go today to celebrate Christmas with your families, you have hanging over that as Christians the concept or the understanding of Christ's coming King. Isn't that what the angels proclaimed? They said, unto you this day is born the city of the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Right? This, this adorable King that we have. What is it that makes us Christians. We sing Christmas carols like, O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him. I wonder, friends, with all of the eloquence I can muster, with all the, 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 the heart I can, I can put into it, I can a if I can ask you, do you adore this King? 
this, this hope. If what I've said is true, right? If you, if you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, I understand. Let's talk about it. But if, if you agree with me that our hope is in Christ, that this resurrection of this, this baby that was born, that we celebrate, is this depth of ground of hope in eternal life, does it bring you to adore the King? Does it bring you to adore Christ? Does it bring you to love Him? As I sung the hymns this morning, as I was singing them before we began service, practicing a little bit, came to that song where it said, Christ and in Christ alone, my hope is found. In Christ alone, my hope is found. And my heart had a weight upon it. As I stood here, I, could, I, I, I literally put my head down on this pulpit in tears because of the, the depth of that statement. In Christ, my hope is found. Think about the, the Corinthians for a moment. Think about Paul's heart as he writes to these Corinthians. As he, as he addresses them and he says, brothers and sisters, it's futile, it's vain, it's dead, it's empty. You're still in your sins if Christ be not raised. The, think of the, 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 uh, the message the Apostle Paul is giving. The, the call that the Apostle Paul is giving. The, the plea the Apostle Paul is giving. Brothers and sisters, don't lose your hope in this adorable king. Don't lose your hope in this adorable king. How are some of the ways that they had lost their hope? They'd turned to the world's ideas. They'd turned away from the king to what they could see in front of them. They'd turned away from their faith in Jesus Christ to the world's ideas. How much so... I, I, I would bet you that if I were to ask that anyone in this room who has friends can think of a friend and point to them and say, yeah, that, that person, they, had, they, they, they don't have hope because their hope is in something that's dead. They think they do. They think they've figured it out. They think they have the philosophy figured out. They think they have the understanding figured out. They think they have it figured out, but they don't know the real hope. Imagine someone from our century Going back in time, speaking to someone, say, 700 years ago or so. He has the fastest horse in town. He has, the, he has the, the fastest horse in town. He can go the fastest person around. That horse can do 25 miles an hour. He's the fastest person. That person from our century is going, you don't know what fast is. You don't know what fast is. Right? I have a car that can do, well, more than 70, even though I shouldn't. We speak to a world who doesn't know that they don't have hope. They walk around thinking they have hope. But the Apostle Paul says, if you don't have Christ, if you don't have the resurrected Lord, if you don't adore Him, you don't have hope. You don't have life. Paul gets into his conclusion in this text. And his conclusion is hope in 1 Corinthians 20. The message that Paul states, this is where it's glorious. So Paul says, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He says, you've followed vain philosophies. Your, your hope is empty, but mine is not. Your hope is, is vacuous. It's a storefront with no building behind it. But my hope stands on the reality of the raised Jesus Christ. It's not a hope of wonder. There's something Dr. Vodibakum always says. I hear him say it often. and he, I heard him teach it in a class. And Dr. Vodibakum is a, is a theologian. He graduated from um, Oxford. He's an incredibly brilliant man. And he said... He, he, he said I find so many Christians forget how, to, how true the Bible is. He says, this is what you need to understand. The Bible is a collection of historically reliable text. We can verify these things happened. Two, it's written by eyewitnesses. Right? 
during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. If these things hadn't happened, somebody else would have come along and said, uh-uh, you're lying about that. But nobody did, because they did happen. The, the 500 eyewitnesses that were there, the people that were there verified it. Yeah, that was there. I saw this risen Christ. Paul tells the Corinthians uh, later on in this, uh, earlier on in this chapter, you know these five, the, some of these 500 people. You've met these eyewitnesses yourself. Paul appeals in this text when he confesses the risen Christ to eyewitnesses of this. Dr. Vodibachum says, the text of the Bible is historically reliable. It's written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, which make, specific, which make supernatural claims that fulfill specific prophecies. There's nothing else in the world like this. When Paul says, but in fact Christ has been raised, there are those who will say, eh, we can't really know that. But that's not true. It is simply not true. We're not basing our faith on a feeling. We're not basing our faith on, on some idea. Paul doesn't ask the Corinthians, well, you know when I preached to you about Jesus Christ raised, you had that feeling in your heart, and that's how you knew it was true? No. The Apostle Paul says, you met the eyewitnesses of Jesus' Christ's, uh, Jesus's resurrection. You met these people. They confessed to you what they saw. My account is not based on your feelings or some uh, idea. If you have ever read any other books, any other religious text, the Quran or, you know, writings of, uh, in Buddhism or Hindu Sanskrit or anything like that, you find these amazing supernatural claims that nobody could have witnessed. Like, for example, the story of Mother Earth, uh, of the, the I, forget, I forget the name of the deity. She goes to Brahma as a cow and begs for him to bring peace, and he sends Krishna. These are, this, is, this is in the writings, right? Nobody can witness this. This can't, uh, this, this doesn't exist in any, you know, you can't, nobody can go and say, yeah, I saw that happen. I saw the earth turn into a cow and then, and the earth spirit turn into a cow and then talk to this other spirit and then nobody can witness that. God didn't do it that way. God came in time and space with eyewitnesses. He sent a physical baby to be born by that virgin that night. And he sent supernatural claims and signs to prove that it was from him. Prophecies, so many prophecies fulfilled in Christ that the odds of, the, of, of them not being from God is impossible. 300, two or three prophecies fulfilled in Christ, okay, maybe coincidence. But 300 fulfilled by Christ, impossible. Written thousands of years before him, completely impossible. Eyewitnesses, specific prophecies. Paul crescendos his statement here. We have seen that Paul holds no hope for those that have a false gospel. Paul holds no hope for those that aren't in Christ. The resurrection is central here. If we're to believe Christianity the way the, the, way the Apostle Paul does, our confession must be, if you don't confess the living Christ, the one who has been raised from the dead, there's no hope for you. There's no life for you. That's Paul's confession here. This hope is, his hope is in Christ, and Paul raises the, central, the centrality of the resurrection as his hope. If you have to sum up the gospel in one word, or two words, Christ raised, that sums all of the gospel. It sums his coming because he has to come to be raised. It sums his living. He has to live to be raised. He has to die to be raised. And when he is raised... It's the culmination. Paul in Romans chapter 1 proclaims the power of the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And in verse 2, he says, because God raised him from the dead. He declared Christ in the spirit of power by raising him from the dead. Throughout the apostle Paul's uh, description of the gospel, his teaching uh, from God to us, is the centrality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The centrality of faith in Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection, without this faith, your faith might as well be Buddhism. It might as well be Islam. It might as well be anything else that you can find temporary hope in because that's all it is. Our proclamation is our hope is eternal. Our Christ is eternal. And He has been raised. This is, uh, this is something that is counter 
to the world. It was counter to the world of the Corinthians, and it's counter to our world. You start talking about people coming back from the dead, you're going to eventually have somebody laughing at you. Even after thousands of years of Christendom, even after the ideas of Christianity have saturated all parts of culture, there will still be many, just like those Athenians, who mock the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or twist it. There are many false gospels out there. There are many gospels that don't center on the resurrection of Christ. There are many gospels that are just a step off this way, just like the Corinthians. I believe Jesus is God. I believe that, that he died for my sins. Just one step off. But, you know, that resurrection thing, I don't buy it. One step off becomes a false gospel. One step away becomes a false gospel. There are many false religions, many world ideologies, and all of them are answered in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the historical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those that have tried to disprove the historical reality of Jesus Christ most of them have either given up or become Christians. You can't disprove the reality of Jesus Christ. He's a historical fact. If you want to get yourself laughed out of historical academia, being one of, one of my passions is, is history, start teaching that Jesus Christ didn't exist. There are many secular uh, people who will not confess Jesus Christ as Lord, but they're, they're historians and they know that that man did exist. He's too historically well documented. There's more documentation of Christ's existence than there are of some whole countries coming in, nations coming in and out of existence. There were there are, uh, nations of Native Americans here in the United States that have came and, and gone, and there's little arrowheads and, and things left, and that's about all we know about them. There's nations all over the world that nobody ever heard of, but Jesus Christ, this one man from 2,000 years ago, is so well documented. He's more documented than the writings of Julius Caesar or Plato or uh, um, Homer or I the Iliad. The, the documentation is unquestionable. Christ has been raised. And those who have honestly tried to disprove it, like I said, they either gave up or became Christians. This is the test. This is the foundation. This is the Christ. In Him, we have every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That's Paul's confession in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. In Christ, God has blessed us with every blessing in heavenly places. This is not to say God's going to give you a new car or a new house. Right? God loves you too much to give you those things if they'll destroy you. Every blessing means eternal life in Jesus Christ. Every blessing means sonship. Every blessing means hope. Paul told the Philippians... In chapter 1, verse 21, that when he died, he considered it gain. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Imagine that. Walking this life, shipwrecked, beaten, robbed, beaten to death, stoned to death, and brought back to life by, by God, the Apostle Paul. This, are, this is his life. And he says, to live is Christ. I might get stoned tomorrow. I might live again. I don't know. That's already happened once. But... To die is gain. Why is it gain? Because he's getting to meet the king he adores. This, that point I brought up before. Do you adore Christ? Right? If you die in Christ, you go immediately to be with him. All the tribulation that, that Christ promised. He said, he said there will be tribulation. There will be trial. He said there will be temptation. And then he goes to his disciples and says, fear not. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the fear and trembling. I have overcome the problem. So much so that the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians in his second letter, chapter 4, that all the weight, all the suffering that, Christ, that Paul had been through was light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory. He's writing to the same people, right? He, he addresses them and says, no, 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 you've got to believe in the risen Christ. He gets them back on course. And then they come back and go, the Romans are persecuting us. The Jews are persecuting us. We're being killed in the streets. We're, 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 how, how is this good? And Paul says, all of that stuff that you're suffering is light and momentary compared to the weight of glory. The, uh, uh, the great Augustine of Hippo, um, he wouldn't appreciate me using the word great of him. 
but I use it because he was a man who stood in his time for God. He stood against heresies. He stood against things. And God raised him up to do great things. In his prayer, he writes, Haste, Lord, to act, to stir us up, and call us back. Inflame us. Draw us to thee. Stir us up and grow sweet unto us. Let us now love thee. Let us run after thee. Augustine understood. It's easy to grow cold. As I've tried today in, in my words to show you a Christ that is glorious, a Christ that is worth hanging on to, a Christ that is worth loving, a Christ that is worth living for, it is easy to go grow cold. And Augustine prayed, Lord, stir us up after thee. Lord, love, let us run after thee. I wrote a poem many years ago, and I always put it at the end of this sermon, and sometimes I don't know whether I want to share it or not. Um, I think I will this evening, because this is this evening. I'm used to preaching on Wednesday nights, sorry, this morning. Um, this is my expression of that hope. And the Christian should walk out every day expressing this hope. The poem goes like this. My old name, sinner. My old nature, wicked. My old state of soul, wretched. Then came my Savior. I wonder if you know him. My state, hopeless. My life, useless. My heart, stone. Then came my Christ. I wonder if you know him. My works, dead. My deserts, wrath. My future, judgment. Then came my Lord. I wonder if you know him. My new name is redeemed. My new nature, sanctified. My soul, whole. My new state, grateful. My life, his. My heart, flesh. My works, fruitful. My deserts, inheritance. My future, marriage. And all of this is the sole work of my Savior, Christ the Lord. This is the hope that we're talking about today. This is the life that we hope in Christ. Whether it's recent, the loss of a loved one. Whether it's a fear of the future. Whether it's darkness of this world. The hope is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means those we have lost will be resurrected. And this resurrected King will return. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen.